gentlemen, it's really my pleasure to address to you in my capacity as a UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of IDPs, which is a mandate I assumed in November 2016. I was appointed by the UN and Human Rights Council for a term of three years. I am pleased to be given this opportunity to give the keynote speech for this expert workshop on internal displacement and transitional justice. I very much would like to thank Swiss Peace for taking the lead in organizing such an important and timely event and the University of Basel for so kindly hosting it, personified by the director but also professor of the university and of course with the support of the donors who believe in this endeavor. This workshop is important to me as it is vital to continuously take stock of progress and non-progress with regard to the protection and assistance for IDPs, examining some of the outstanding challenges to effective responses to their human rights and needs and identifying ways forward in addressing these issues. And so I'm very, actually very pleased that uh, people from different parts of the world have also come to join us, not only tonight, but mainly for tomorrow in the expert seminar to present their papers on different case studies on transitional justice and IDPs. Because we need really an understanding from not only at the policy level, as the professor had put it, but really from the bottom. This workshop is moreover very valuable for me and my mandate, and my mandate as I will be dedicating my second report to the General Assembly, that is my report um, next year in 2018 to the topic of transitional justice and IDPs. So the papers that we presented and the discussions that we had during the workshop tomorrow will therefore directly feed into the report. My mandate has had a long history of collaboration with research institutions, academic networks and civil society organizations. I appreciate the opportunity to continue such engagement while I myself is not totally an academic, like my predecessors, I do have highly value the immense role of academic institutions as well as research and advocacy entities like Swiss Peace in engendering a rational discourse in the pressing issues of our times, which I have to say is sometimes sort of lacking in this age of social media. The issue of transitional justice is one such important issue. I would like to offer some perspectives based on country visits and consultations where my mandate had been able to meet and discuss directly with IDPs themselves in the investigation of the human rights protection issues that they face and their need for transitional justice, as well as with high-level officials from national and local governments, civil society and UN country teams, among others, particularly on the challenges and approaches. As you may also know, I have been very much involved in transitional justice issues, especially in Asia, and continue to do so. But first of all, what's a displacement situation? <coughs> While there are positive developments that should be highlighted and welcomed, particularly in the development of normative standards and humanitarian approaches to the issue of displacement, we do must acknowledge the extremely worrying global situation of internal displacement today. By the end of 2016, according to the figures of the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, with which I had worked in my previous life, an estimated 14.3 million people were living in internal displacement as a result of violence and conflict. This number has nearly doubled since 2000, and annual increases in the global displacement total have been in the billions. Some 6.9 million persons have been internally displaced due to conflict and violence in 2016 alone. In addition, 24.2 million persons were internally displaced by disasters in the same year. Now, all in all, this is equivalent to one person internally displaced every second. As per the, the description and the definition provided to us by the UN Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement. In addition, moreover, 
An increasing number of internally displaced persons are locked in situations of protracted displacement, sometimes for years or even decades. I'm looking at my colleague from Colombia, and there we see that that is one problem, and as well as, of course, in the Philippines. And, mind you, ladies and gentlemen, these figures that I have just rattled off do not even include millions worldwide who are estimated to be internally displaced by other causes such as national development projects, which are very much understudied, very much under-researched, and so for the academics here, that is a challenge I would like to pose. The United Nations, rightly, for now, focuses much attention, needed attention, on the plight of refugees and migrants globally. As you know, there are the two compacts coming up next year, the Global Compact on Migration and another on refugees. However, already during my first statement as a special rapporteur to the General Assembly in October this year, I have urged member states and the international community not to neglect those who are internally displaced, those who have not crossed interna internationally recognized borders, and frequently they are among the most vulnerable and marginalized. Now, those who cross international borders as refugees or migrants, including those in irregular situations, frequently begin their dangerous journeys as I often fleeing conflict or violence. I see a gentleman here who was part of that movement, mobile, that, that um, movement from being an IDP to being a refugee. Too often, they fail to find the security, assistance, livelihoods, or durable solutions in their countries of origin that would enable them to remain. Moreover, Many IDPs fail to cross international borders and for different reasons may simply desire to stay in the countries of origin or may not be able to cross international borders. Majority of the IDPs worldwide are in fact in also in protracted displacement, meaning those who cannot find durable solutions due to obstacles, especially beyond their control. It is very clear, ladies and gentlemen, that we are facing a massive and neglected crisis of internal displacement. There is not much at the political level that actually address the governmental responsibility nor the international coordination and policy on internal displacement. We must therefore become more effective at preventing as well as reducing internal displacement, but I would like to insist in accordance with the guiding principles on internal displacement, so that at the same time, protection of the human rights of IDPs can be strengthened as lives, dignity, and security are in danger, endangered, and the precarity and abnormality of life continue to prevail among them. It is a priority for entities and for people like us to try to find durable solutions for IDPs in accordance with the criteria and principles provided by the Interagency Standing Committee Framework on Durable Solutions for IDPs. Some of the obstacles to IDPs finding durable solutions are actually related to ongoing situations of conflict and violence, or in even in post-conflict situations, they are not included as IDPs, or in, in any of the peace building nor transitional justice processes. Internal displacement issues are soon, soon forgotten. Many times, peace processes and negotiations do not include IDPs, either at the negotiation tables nor in relevant advocacy forums. Moreover, transitional justice processes and mechanisms often fail to acknowledge that IDPs are, in the very first place, victims of the conflict, nor are they deserving of inclusion in the peace processes themselves. It is also a constant remark that in the realm of international humanitarian law and international criminal law, arbitrary internal displacement, which is actually also described in the UN Guiding Principles, this may occur during conflict, and they are not acknowledged judicially, nor as a social issue 
for building social cohesion, accountability, and reconciliation. I have had many discussions with IDPs themselves who, after a conflict, are simply expected to go back home after the conflict and pick up from there and forget it. In a good number of situations, IDPs may even attempt to return but find that their lands have been taken away, their properties destroyed or looted, and or their former homes occupied by others. It is with this in mind that I have committed, in my capacity as a human special rapporteur, to continue to raise the awareness of critical internal displacement challenges globally and to assist states who have the primary responsibility to protect IDPs to assist these states to prevent and reduce internal displacement in accordance with the guiding principles. In doing so, I have identified also a number of other issues that I will focus attention on during my term as mandate holder and which I consider to be essential to meeting the wider challenge of protecting IDPs and reducing internal displacement. One of these thematic focus areas is, of course, as I as I said, to ensure the inclusion of IDPs, particularly in decision-making processes that actually are very relevant to them. There is a Nigerian saying from Yoruba, I believe, that you cannot shave the head of a person without the person being there. And I thought that was very apt in saying concerning IDPs participation in the processes of decision-making concerning them. It is ensuring that IDPs are part of transitional justice processes within the broader conflict of peace building is therefore vital in order to address the human rights violations in the aftermath of conflict, authoritarian regimes, or occupation. And they can contribute to address internal displacement and achieving durable solutions for IDPs. Importantly, they can also contribute to sustainable peace that is basically being worked on by different stakeholders in a particular um, country. Indeed, for me, IDP participation is essential in any protection and solutions for IDPs. I have, in fact, dedicated my first report to the UN General Assembly, which I presented last October in New York on IDP participation. I would like to invite everyone to consult and read it, and it's available online. I recognize the important work already undertaken in this field and will be collaborating with relevant states, the United Nations, NGOs, and national human rights institutions in order to operationalize existing resources and provide technical assistance for their implementation in this area. On transitional justice per se, the experience of forced displacement often encompasses massive human rights abuses prior to, during, and in the aftermath of the displacement, the legacy of which continues while persons remain in displacement, and even after they have achieved physical return, resettlement, or integration elsewhere. We must recall that the guiding principles on internal displacement itself have provided in describing who is an IDP that human rights violations per se may be a cause of displacement. Moreover, arbitrary internal displacement committed under certain conditions may by itself also be a human rights violation or a breach under international humanitarian law or may constitute a crime under international criminal law. During displacement, human rights violations may occur where conditions for the protection or the lack of accountability persist. In fact, the guiding principles dedicate majority of its principles to the guarantees under international human rights and IHL. We should also take note that while the guiding principles per se may be considered soft law in its entirety, many of its principles are by themselves binding under treaty law, national legislation, and even these codes. Permit me for going in, and, uh, into the legal framework as well, being a lawyer, I can't help it. At the end of the displacement itself, however, the situation of IDPs usually continue to be confronted with challenges in the search for durable solutions. In order to achieve such durable solutions, IDPs must receive justice for the harm done to them. 
the violations of their rights, and the loss of life and property through processes, including transitional justice, that go beyond their physical return, local integration, or settlement in Syria. In numerous internal displacement situations, however, IDPs do not obtain justice, or if at all, they receive only partial redress or reparations for human rights violations that they have suffered, including for the loss of housing, land, or property. In fact, the Interagency Standing Committee, or the IASC, Framework on Durable Solutions for IDPs points to durable solutions as actually a component of, tra of transitional justice. The framework recognizes that in the achievement of durable solutions for IDPs, this may entail the right to reparation, justice, truth, and closure for past injustices through transitional justice or appropriate measures. And also, the framework says, IDPs who have been victims of violations of international human rights or humanitarian law, including arbitrary displacement, must have full and non-discriminatory access to effective remedies and access to justice, including, where appropriate, access to existing transitional justice <laughs> mechanisms, reparations, and information on the causes of these violations. Moreover, transitional justice processes have traditionally addressed a too narrow range of the serious <coughs> civil and political rights violations while relatively neglecting the other human rights that violations that IDPs experience. In fact, I believe that the spatial element in internal displacement is often neglected where economic, social, and cultural rights also play out. One major challenge in post-conflict situations when it comes to achieving transitional justice for IDPs is when there is an absence of any of the mechanisms themselves on transitional justice, especially where such mechanisms are essential to achieve redress for IDPs, such as the right to truth. Even where, where TJ mechanisms exist, fully incorporating IDP issues is often perceived as costly, as complex. The understanding that IDPs have the right to participate fully in transitional justice mechanisms and peace building processes is underestimated. It must be reinforced, I believe, as must the responsibility of governments to guarantee their participation and ensure that transitional justice is achieved for them in practice. IDPs must be included in community reconciliation and social cohesion projects, which form elements of peace-building initiatives and from which they are frequently excluded. Moreover, IDPs are seen to be a homogeneous group when, as we know, they are not. In all of the above, the journey or replica principles covering the four pillars of the right to truth, the right to justice, the right to reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence are useful guideposts in our endeavors to look at transitional justice and internal displacement. This is something that I would like to um, really emphasize because so much has to be done in this field. There is, of course, the importance of research, collaboration, and the participation of the landing in these issues. Seeking a strategic collaboration with a special rapporteur um, or in the promotion of truth justice, reparation, and guarantees of non-recurrence has been already one of the priorities when I show the mandate. Um, right now, it's um, Pablo Digni, but I believe the new special rapporteur will be changed sometime towards the end of the year or the next year. But in this regard, I participated in the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights Regional Consultations on Transitional Justice in the Asia-Pacific region in Sri Lanka, uh, particularly because I have been working very closely with IDPs and victims of human rights violations in Asia. But also, there are other actions and activities happening, and that is, for example, the Middle East Regional Conference on Conflict and Human Rights in February in Doha, and the Asia Pacific NHRI's Millennial Conference on the same theme last month in Bangkok are very important forum to discuss these issues. In all of these, transitional justice 
has been seen as glaringly insufficient in the protection of IDPs because nobody is giving it enough attention. As a special rapporteur on the human rights of IDPs, it is therefore my duty to engage in dialogue with governments undergoing transitional justice and peace processes to promote the inclusion of IDPs and as well as to learn about good practices, their experiences and challenges. I have in fact asked for visits to several of these countries, including Colombia, Syria, and Libya, which are among the papers, the case studies to be presented in the academic conference tomorrow. As Special Rapporteur, I also use the mandate to gather positive practices and guidelines in case studies on the issues. As mentioned, my thematic report next year will be on this issue. Recognizing the important work already undertaken, including research and case studies conducted by the International Center for Transitional Justice and the Brookings LSE project on internal displacement, among other contributions, I think there is much to be to go on. And in fact, of course, Swiss peace has been a steadfast rock in the issue of uh, transitional justice. I have been very privileged to have worked with CSPs, not only as participant in one of the trainings, but equally when I was a government representative to the Transitional Justice Reconciliation Commission for the Baxamoro in the Philippines. Equally, in addition to the guiding principles and the framework of dual solutions, I would like to recognize other international standards such as the principles on housing and property restitution for refugees and displaced persons, as well as the related handbook on housing and property restitution. These deliver valuable guidelines relating to specific areas of concern. The last topic I would like to share with you is, of course, 2018, which will be upon us in a few weeks. But 2018 is actually also the 20th anniversary of the Guiding Principles of Internal Displacement. And it presents for all of us a unique opportunity to take stock of the challenges and progress that has been made up to date in preventing and responding to internal displacement in accordance with the GP, the Guiding Principles, as well as supporting global solutions. I also consider the anniversary as an important opportunity to forge new commitment around the common goal of reducing internal displacement in line with the protection standards of the guiding principles, for which we can pursue more strategic and joint action in favor of IDPs with the support of all of you. Within this GP Guiding Principles 20 anniversary framework, we would like to look for act, at action for IDPs at the national level as well. It is important for me as a special rapporteur and also coming from the field and as a practitioner that this is actually one of the priorities. We also have to look at the IDPs, not just as a homogeneous group, but with clear understanding of the specific needs, vulnerabilities and capacities of internally displaced women, girls, men, boys, indigenous peoples, IDPs with disabilities, etc. In conclusion, I very much look forward to hearing the case studies and analysis from the different participants in the workshop tomorrow, and am again very appreciative of the valuable input that this will provide me in my report. But let me conclude by once again commending Swiss Peace with the University of Basel for helping bring attention to this important issue, and I look forward to hearing and participating in the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention.